whatever it is. <laughs> Hey, John. Hey, so I have. All right, since we're live, we'll make you start. Hi, welcome along to uh, Lightning Talks. Oh, um, oh thank you. Yeah, sorry, Karen. Um, so we'll do some quick news and events. Who's got a Lightning Talk? So it's three. Quarter. Sure, oh, you know what I mean? I do. We'd like to dig down there. It's fine. It's four. Okay. Oh, John, you've got a lightning talk, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened. I don't know. I can't do it. Sure, we've got loads of time. Uh, so, uh, some events first. Um, so, he says Manchester uh, is a free security conference yeah, in Manchester, obviously, uh, end of August. Um, Tickets have all gone on sale and have been captured, but if you're on the waiting list, they're slowly releasing some. They are free. Yeah. So get on the waiting list. It's a, I, it's a really good I got my ticket this weekend. Oh, off the wait list. Oh, so, okay. so it does work. If, you, if, you if you're a company that doesn't have anybody going to this event and you think you do security, say <laughs> that <laughs> uh, Yeah, this is some conference thing. Uh, who hasn't got a ticket? Who has got a ticket? Get your tickets and improve mine and Bill and Arena's level of sleep. <laughs> it's a good investment as far as we're concerned between uh, now and October. Oh, we should also say potentially um, on events, we might do a sprint in September. So there's a sprint going on in London, the same way that we did last year. If you remember, we did like a sprint at the same time as London. Um, so we might do that at some point in September, probably yeah. on a weekend, maybe on a 12th. Who, if we did set that up, who, without commenting, who would be interested in going? So the next yeah. people are quite interested. <laughs> cool. Well, we should definitely look at that. Uh, line of things at the moment with Gabriel and uh, we'll speak to them as well. Cool. So I can do something later, but we will post it in Twitter and also if we do anything. So. Yeah, because yeah, let you know plenty of plenty of time. Uh, talking to the conference, we've got some sponsors, so uh, Access are our platform sponsor. Yay! Uh, so thanks, Access. Uh, we also have Pathway Education and the Web Apprentice. Uh, Yay! Yes, go. Uh, Silver, always. Copy it. Azure Drop, Azure Play to pack me on and talk to him. And Brothers, we have Code Enigma, uh, JNR, and Mika, and we also have CTI, and we're doing yeah. team. And apparently, mugs. Yeah. I've got a promise of mugs. Yeah. So it's worth it to come and do your mugs. <laughs> uh, and last minute, which is today, I think, I'm spotted with it's Drupal Yorkshire. Woo! We're doing that spot, so So, anyone here from Yorkshire? <laughs> Did you just put your hand up for cash? No, I didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's good news, yeah. So we might go to the boxing ball room again. Got some forest to spend sense. So coming up in October as well is uh, TripCon Europe. Um, so tickets on sale still. I don't believe that's correct. I've checked recently. Yeah, I think that's right until, <laughs> until then. Obviously, that price is in euros, so <laughs> uh, this will change significantly. <laughs> unless it's more political content here. Actually, though, on, on a serious point, if you are going to this, the association was asking who from the UK is going, so they're vaguely aware. So if they need to help out, we'll just be aware in case there are difficulties getting back um, because of. Uh, Let's just say political fuckery and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we are. Uh, so, carry on. Some news. Um, so, they're adding Composer Scaffolding to Core. Um, you know, we used to go off and get the Composer Scaffolding from our GitHub repo, but now it's, it's moving into Core. So, um, 
I guess that sets up a new Drupal project with the right bits and pieces. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all to do with things like you're saying to PHP files and stuff like that that you might have changed, but might have been updated from there, and then, and then sort of all those kind of things out that are Drupal requirements that don't kind of fall into core. So it's something that's important to do, so having core being able to do it makes, makes a bunch of sense. Uh, can you dribble at eight? I think that's, that's been committed this week. So, uh, uh, event is dispatched before configuration import and export to transform on the configuration. It might be worth quickly just diving into this one um, because, please, please, please. because this doesn't make this isn't the most helpful uh, title. Let's just jump in here. Um, title is still the same. But basically, what this is so uh, this is to do with. Um, CMI version 2, so we're doing more config work, even though we have an awesome config uh, system. There seems to be this config environment beta stable, so I presume that's a new beta stable module. I haven't had a play with it yet, I don't know where that's up to, uh, or if it's been committed in any name, shape, or form. But it well, must be, because if you have that enabled, um, then there's a new uh, Symphony event that will get fired. Um, around the time that you're doing your config import and output and stuff, so you can hook into that yourself. Uh, um, so yeah, really, really exciting stuff that was previously like config filter. Um, so visual import and export transform, so you can get in and start changing stuff after the config export. Really cool thing. I think it's cool anyway. Next. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is a new a new Drupal module from a, a guy that's never made a Drupal module before, um, which is a nice uh, lazy loading fancy load thing. Um, have a look. <laughs> Any other notes? Did you did you have a close? No. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it looks, it looks really cool because it'll place load your images, but also like the placeholder just shows the dots and color. That's really cool. Uh, it might be worth spinning up uh, Umami and see what it looks like with all the different images that it has there, or <coughs> if you have a project like Is that not already Umami? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, oh, I, it's, no, it's not. No, it's just cooking. It's just other cooking, unless they've changed all the images on it. I don't recognize any of those. Uh, so, this is something that Rikesh uh, mentioned a few days ago. So, if you, if you never want to expose this uh, slash node of your site, then you can uh, disable that through this config option here, um, which is always handy. Uh, or uh, you can just disable that view. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Like, it's one of my favorite things to do. Like, someone says, oh, we've got these people to do is like a Drupal site. Can you check it out? First thing that I go and see is like, can I go see the update file and the upcoming version is? Can I can I go to node and see it all just go and it just spits out a load of stuff that no one ever thought to look at? So yeah, so it's interesting to see yeah uh, people so, yeah, so if you didn't know there's a view views front page view uh, if you disable that you can get rid of that default front page thing. Which is cool because no one ever uses a slash node as front page for it's like it's actually in production, right? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, there's a new article on uh, Drupal Docs, which is about running an accessibility review. Uh, so, it's obviously a start point of automated tooling, but um, there's plenty of other stuff to look at in there. Uh, it's fairly lengthy, and it's quite, quite nice. We should point out at this juncture that when Andrew McPherson does his talks on accessibility testing, he says you can't do it. Totally automated, so it is just like a start. This is just how you start getting. Oh, no, no, I just read the um, first few paragraphs and it was like stuff. No, but there's a load of other stuff in there. And also, we, we have boring data we write. Yeah, yeah, jQuery UI is yeah. gonna like everything jQuery is gonna go. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, apparently, you don't need it. That's uh, speaking of which. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is jQuery Accordion, uh, which is a nice way of showing jQuery UI application and what, can, what you can do if you're relying on it. 
So that will give you like, the jQuery UI accordion back if you turn jQuery off. Yeah. But you can do an accordion with native browser. All right, it's all right. <laughs> but yeah, not using any JavaScript at all. No, but you might have to rewrite your site to do that. Yeah. Right. Whereas with this, this is a plugin for like just putting it back uh, as it were. So I, I wanted to upgrade this workflow, and it broke broke the site because it was wrong because the HTML in the template was relying on relying on what the, the thing was. We had to change the so We had to change jQuery. UE or jQuery version in uh, a minor update. You can change jQuery and UE, that's not been touched for five years. That's that was like jQuery. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it, it changed, potentially changed some classes that might be exposed so it could have broken some side. Yeah, as it did. Oh, we were uh, water project. So we were expecting a plugin to be there. And I think, I think either the water or the <laughs> Either the web form or the website. Uh, Result was relying on it, so we're basically ended up using libraries. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm not sure what if that's this does, but um, probably something. Um, Drupal security release. So, uh, is anybody using the workspaces module? Yep. Good. Uh, this has a uh, edition bypass, access bypass. Sorry. Good. <laughs> uh, everyone know what workspaces is. Not even that then. It's showing a list of what's going on in the next versions of Drupal. Okay. So, um, if you didn't already know, Meetup is changing some API. Uh, so, version 2 is being dropped completely. I believe all this required, although it's a bit fuzzy about that from, from the docs. It's just been our website is going to break. Uh, so, that means that our website is going to break <laughs> even more than it is. Even more than <laughs> Raphael implied that you can't do it on you can't use the L off bit on free. Yeah, he needed a pro account as well. Yeah, which but he couldn't do it even on the pro account because the events were free. Yeah. So we might be copy pasting or yeah, oh, leaving me up. Just saying. Does does everyone appreciate me too? Yes. Good. <laughs> Everybody else? Because we don't use it really to capture people's details. And no, but it does so enough it, updates to like. It's, it's, it's the notifications, another event, and the reminder today that it is today. Stuff comes down. Okay. I have a calendar for you to remember to say this one. Yeah. Well, well, I think we had to uh, take a look at some first. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. That might have died. We don't have other options we have other than me. Uh, we can use something like Tito, which we usually on conference, that free event there. Um, you remember it? Tito. Tito. When you, when you buy a ticket, <laughs> <laughs> you'll be using the site. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, Tito .to is what we use for the end conference. Uh, Either that or we roll our own on the, on the website because we have a Drupal website. Um, wow. It's very <laughs> unloved. It's probably got. To sell more in the moment. We have an employment. Sometimes it just has a good friend like an Alice Reed piece. You know, you can have the Alice Reed piece. So you can easily understand who is coming. Yep. Yeah. And I know it's hard for the calendar to be released. I mean, I found it very useful for me. I mean, I mean, how many years have we used that? Five years? Well, maybe a big guy. Yeah. Probably longer than that. Yeah, how about morning first? Um, <laughs> when, when we started using it, it was useful because yeah, it got us all organized a little bit better. Yeah. But nowadays, maybe not. Uh, and I know it's another class. Yep. All of that now. Um, so if you're, in this, uh, if you're in, interested in WebP, WebP is uh, <laughs> an image format. Yes. Um, so it's is not the like, bitching about that. Yeah, the before the start. Yes. Yeah, so if you have a look on, it's not like spot on everything. But if you have a look on, can I use? Uh, look for WebP. It's uh, an image format um, that is very uh, efficient. 
uh, but it doesn't work on IE and it doesn't work on Safari, but it's associated that they're experimenting with it. Um, it doesn't work on iOS Safari, but it's got like wide support and everything else. So there is a Drupal module um, that Alex Moreno, who works for Acquia, is uh, looking is, is working on uh, to get stable that will um, allow websites that support WebP to have a WebP image first and then fall back to other image formats and it will generate the WebP image for you when you upload something else so that you'll get better front end uh, performance. So yeah, that sounds cool. Uh, just Tim is reached out for water. Um, woo! So yeah, if you're Who's still on brush eight. I think one or two of us. Unless it's the packaging with the site now, or we package it with the site, it tends to stick with the site. But yeah, do it with the site. Yeah. So, uh, you so know, it's just do like a composer update. Yeah. Okay. What we have done today, yeah, for the first time. Is that where you're going? We should. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, item two, so this was my stuff all about customizing their new uh, task bar. Uh, anybody using item two? Yes, they are. So just to tell you about it's a really um, nice article. Uh, so there's a paragraph release on the way. Um, Who uses the paragraph? <laughs> it's um, a way of generating fuckloads of database entries. Yes, but if we're, if we're using paragraphs and you're planning on using the next version, so like, get testing. Because I imagine any, anything you can fix now will make your life easier later. Does anyone have a look at this version yet? Yeah. It'd be really cool to know if it did things like if the experimental front end, the like UI for it, which everyone uses, is way better. Uh, if that is like less experimental, hopefully that will be like, hopefully that changes in the new release. Um, that's like, maybe, like, maybe in the uh, So, let read this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so this is what we're catching up about. They're looking at replacing uh, JPEG really UI for Yeah, yeah. So, um, should you right while you're talking? Yeah. Well, I can just tell you a few things. Somebody's going to do that. The really, <laughs> good, the really good bit about the thread is that somebody has gone through all the major non jQuery alternatives to autocomplete and actually done a full review of them with Drupal's use case yeah. and see if they're accessible, accessible or usable or worth investigating any further. Uh, so far, it's, uh, we've got the same issues so I've been playing to that. Um, so far, it's not looking particularly promising. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you go to the thread, uh, you can see a couple of players. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say this, man, but they can see this. Okay. I think the ones that are most accessible are down some of the features. Yes, that's the problem. So, like, like multiple, yeah, multiple items is the biggest problem. So, like, there's one that we've chosen. I don't know. I don't know. Ever, sorry, it's called Chosen. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry, it's called Choices. Ah, so uh, there's a subsequent thread here. Let me just. Uh, and that, that is absolutely brilliant. It does everything we want. It's accessible. Yeah. Until you switch to multiple inputs, and then accessibility goes straight out the window. No, 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 no. So, so here it looks yeah. like as an update, they're looking at awesome fleets. Yeah, <laughs> we, we've got that installed as well. It's awesome complete, yeah. it's really good for the auto completing bit, but it doesn't do the multiples as far as I'm aware. Oh, what auto completing and selecting multiple things yeah. from the yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I might have picked that one just based on the name. Yeah, there was one other one which was recommended to both of us, which is called, uh, is it Nyman? 
guy, Lewis Snyder. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's the one from the uh, UK Gov. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, okay. That, we started off with that one, but then all, uh, also, also complete, also complete, that Leo wrote is a, f a fork of it, I think. Okay. Um, and once we've done this, you're also Oh, there you are. It's gone down. It's gone down. Also, a bit more. A bit more. Beep. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, anyway, Twitter is available <laughs> later if you want to read all of it. Um, but yeah, that's cool to see that uh, progress. We're presenting out two different browsers. That's great. Hit the right one. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Uh, any other news? Good. Uh, Anyone recruiting? Oh, that was that was some news. No, no. I, I, I made a noise as I was about to say. Um, once we've figured out what also complete to use, we also have to figure out like what mobile to use. Um, oh, oh, yeah. The other, like, there's loads of stuff. In, well, there's a few things in jQuery right, that core uses. Yeah, and we need to find like vanilla JS open source accessible versions for all of them. Modal is really tricky. No, it's yeah. kind of it's weak. No problem. Modal is really tricky because we're really tightly coupled to the jQuery UI modal yeah. implementation in our because of in our API. Yeah. So to do it, to go to Drupal 9 and not break backwards compatibility, but to swap that out, we're going to have to like write a compatibility <laughs> layer, which takes something sensible <laughs> and pretends it's jQuery mobile. Uh, jQuery mobile, yeah. So well, the one to look at is called Ali Dialog. Um, it's absolutely Piece of piss to, to be. Is it not fucking like awesome dialogue? No. Awesome. <laughs> but, um, we're, we're possibly going to use it. Um, Andrew checked it out and the person said it's like everything that you went, oh, it does it. Yeah. And, oh, it does it. There he is. Yeah. yeah. The whole way through that. And it looks really good. Um, you do need to do some polyfills, though. Oh, no, you know, it's got polyfills in it. Okay, Ali Dialog. Ali Dialog. As if with like A11Y. Yeah, dialog. dash dialog. Cool. But yeah, we're going to have to like wrap it to make it look like. Yeah, well, we're just dropping what we've got in the tools for you and replacing it. Yeah, of course. So. Uh, I think that's just for the sprint. Oh, unless we deprecate it now, but maybe it's too late though. I guess we could. We, we still got time to deprecate it, stuff, right? So we could. If we forget what we want to do and write an alternative, we could deprecate that and then one end. Yeah. This is unrelated. Um, I've been following something on Drupal.org where the um, attributes system is being moved to a different part of Drupal, which means external projects we have to bring it in without bringing all the Drupal in. So at the moment, it's namespace somewhere where it's not in a very, it's not very reusable. I don't fully understand how to do it, but it's sort of interesting to me because it means we'll be able to use the Drupal attributes uh, object and it like set attribute, remove attribute, add class, method, it's pattern map. Because we'll be able to pull in the, just the attribute object, um, and it would also mean like you could use it in other systems. Um, one of the guys who has a really popular pattern that plugin for Drupal thinks that attributes should go into Twig because it, it would be great to have that in Twig natively. Then that would happen, but moving it out of Drupal into a more reusable space is the first step towards that sort of thing. So it'll be its own kind of composer dependency. Uh, I don't think it's going to be that. I think you'd still require Drupal, but it's something to do with namespace, and I don't, I don't really understand it. Um, but yeah, the idea is to make it less. Tied in the rest of Drupal and more easy for us and things to use, which I feel like really happy with. Yeah, that sounds epic. I have to maybe dig into that for the next one. Yeah, I'll find the link. Cool. Uh, anyone recruiting? I've got the usual three here, so. <laughs> CTI, uh, are they still looking for Yeah, we're always looking for Always looking for them. So, there we are. Uh, in Mika, this has been here since just the hit me up like three or four months ago. Um, was that one? Yeah. If you're interested in job at Avika, uh, no one for that road. There you go. Um, if 
you're interested in Java access, everything in the background. <laughs> uh, yeah, game search. I find your practice is awesome. That's good stuff. Um, right, well, a company that I'm working on, uh, I, I, I are recruiting, but they're doing it through recruiters. So I said, so like, how can we have a link that we can share and tell people that recruiting? When I have a chance, somebody wants to come and work with me, and like, no, I couldn't have one. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so, so if you do, if anybody does want to come and work with me, uh, apply to all the recruiters, I guess. And say, so can we go work with Eli? That's fine, yeah, that uh, Next one is the 10th of September. Um, do you have any things scheduled? Uh, no, we don't actually have a talk confirmed yet. Um, TBC, then. Um, TBC. TBC, yeah, but we will get something awesome. It's something we need to talk about migration again. <laughs> yeah. If you want to be that awesome thing, hit us up, get on the list. I think that's the end, really. So, yeah, that would um, be the last chance to practice something before the unconference if you want to do an unconference talk and want to practice it first. Okay, move on, move on. Uh, right, so who's first? Um, Phil, do you want to do your talk first if you're going to maybe do two? Yeah, that makes sense. Then we can put you on, and then you can have us go, and then, yeah. You might get lucky if the uh, projector might even work. Oh yeah, that makes sense, this works. Put this in here. I think so. Cool. And if you want to mug at the camera, stand about. Yeah, it's not I don't have any slides because I am um, <laughs> um, this is this is kind of the committed first. I'm actually doing a Drupal Con talk. Um, Woo! I know. Right? Um, which is gonna be about the um, and this is gonna be like a five minute introduction to the um, Maybe 10 minutes, but not longer than that, I promise. Um, and it's going to talk about like using it instead of jQuery and how it's not actually much harder than jQuery, but it's a lot nicer, like mentally. Um, so I've, I've built like a little demo thing, um, and I'm going to show you like the markup for it and the, code, the JavaScript for it, and then why um, from D is like a nicer option than jQuery and not actually that much more scary or complicated. Um, so I've been using a view into the jQuery wherever I can and work, and it feels like really, really good. Um, I've been like feeling like I'm writing lots of sync code and stuff that's easier to sort of extend on. Um, there's a few key differences which I'm going to run through now. Um, the main thing, well, or at least a good thing to start off with, is view is a lot more encapsulated. So when you're working with jQuery, you stick a script tag on the page. And then you can like do anything. You can write the CSS selector to get the header or the footer or the edge, the temp edge chart of the list or anything like that. And it's not really scoped, and that doesn't really fit in with like the component-based way that we work or that we're moving towards working at the moment. And um, so one way to do view, and um, probably the way we're most suited to use it on Drupal is to have multiple view applications on a page. So you'd have one application per component. So if you look at the Mark up this page here. We have got um, a div with an ID of name badge demo, and that's going to set our scope for the whole thing. So if I jump into the JavaScript, um, you see the first line or the second line is that element. So what that means is we're creating a new view instance, and all it's concerned with is um, is this div, which on this page doesn't really mean much because there's only one thing on it. But if you had 
a page with like five paragraphs on and then the header region, the footer region, and, and some blocks. Each one of those could be a separate view application, um, which is nice because it keeps everything nicely self-contained um, and it sort of restricts what you can do in, in a positive way. Um, it also means we don't have to do as much like scoping, so we don't have to write code to find something and then find his siblings or his children and so on. So another key difference between working with jQuery and Vue is that we have a lot more um, directives in the actual markup. So say you're writing jQuery and you want something to happen when someone clicks on the button, you give that button a class or a data attribute or an ID, and then you'd reference that in JavaScript. What we do in Vue is we, we use um, some Vue-specific HTML attributes. So you see the things that are sort of a bit brown, because Chrome doesn't know what they are. A lot of those, um, not all of them, like Python 4, that's just sort of old data, that's HTML to do out forever. But the model, colon value, the if, these are all view specific directives. Um, so these are things that are in our HTML, but when the browser has a chance to run the JavaScript, they don't actually appear in the DOM because views already sort of processed them, worked out what they mean, and take them out. So this markup is, is technically invalid because they're, they're HTML attributes that don't start with data and aren't part of the HTML stack. But in practice, it doesn't really matter because the, the, the browser will get rid of that. So I was talking about that button example. If we look down at the button, um, we can't see them at the moment because we haven't started interacting with our application yet. But we've got three buttons, um, and two of them do things when they're clicked on. Um, so this act is a shorthand, and um, it means like, on this event, do this. So we've got a, a click listener, which fires off a method called toggle case, and down here we're doing something a bit more basic. We're actually executing JavaScript um, in line with the, with the markup. So because it's such a simple thing, we're just saying name to be undefined. I haven't bothered writing the methods for that. Um, so this kind of goes in with the idea that we're doing less separation of concerns in the old fashioned sense. We have lots of different files spread out all over the place. Um, and instead, we're focusing on like single file, well, not quite a single file component, but having a lot more stuff in the markup, which um, for me, I, I quite like because it means I don't have to switch between so many different files. Like reading this, I can tell that this is a button, it says reset on it, but I can also tell that when I click on it, this is going to happen. With the jQuery way of doing that, I wouldn't be able to tell that because the button can have 500 classes, and there could be 500 different JavaScript files, each for the jQuery listener or selector rather for one of those classes. So by keeping it all in one file, it feels a bit less sort of pure or semantic, but you get the benefit of being able to see what's going on not more easily. Um, another cool thing you can do, well, another really important thing about Vue is that it's entirely data driven. So jQuery is like DOM driven. We change classes on things, and then if we want to work out if like a mobile menu is expanded, we have to, to write a selector for the mobile menu container and then do like has class is open. Um, with Vue, we sort of define in our markup in our um, JavaScript what data we're holding. So I've got a boolean called capitalize, and I've got a string called name, which is empty at the moment, and then I've got two arrays of names. Um, if I start typing in here, or if I use the value, you see the name changes to Michael. Uh, I can also edit it to fill if I use quotes. And this this level of like DevTools integration is something that we never had with jQuery. Um, if I want to capitalize it, this little button pops up and it's like, ooh, you click me, it's like, fell. And you can see <laughs> capitalize is toggling up here. And um, which is really useful for testing. It's much easier to sort of work out what potential states there are in the application and, and to switch between them. Another thing I like is that it's really easy to sort of stick with, with best practices. So I've got some options here where I can switch to Jamie or Stevie, um, and these are all just like radio buttons. And um, this is an input, 
which I did today's list for to get that so I've also completed that. Um, and because view encourages you to do so much in your markup, um, I find that lends itself well to like doing things properly. So here, these radio buttons, um, it's picking up the value from the markup rather than us like listening for a click on something and then setting the value in JavaScript. So the way that works is with this V model attribute. So V model means like whatever I type in here or whatever whatever the current value is, pass that to view and then view takes over. And that's how we can get it so like reactive. So you can put whatever you want in here. Um, yeah, so I think that's something that's nice about it. And as well as as reacting to changes, you can also hide and show stuff. And um, so view has um, a v if and a v show. What v if does it will actually add and remove things from the DOM. So rather than like the jQuery approach where we do like jQuery dot hide and it would set it to say none, this actually rearranges the whole DOM which is useful if you're doing things like um, showing things in different places based on breakpoint. Um, so if you were just hiding them with CSS, you might have an issue of duplicate IDs. If it was like a Drupal menu, which came with an ID on the block. Um, views approach is to use a virtual and dynamic DOM, so the things are actually removed. So you, have, you run into fewer issues with like duplicate selections and stuff like that. Um, you can also loop through things. So, I jump into my JavaScript. We've got a little placeholder here, Gabriel, and if I reload, that's going to be a different name each time. And also, we've got all of these lists. The way that they're pulled in, I wanted to do a little demo of how you do Ajax, because when jQuery came out, it was really, at the time, it was really important to normalize the way Ajax stuff works. So that was a key draw for jQuery at the time. Um, but now we've got things like Fetch, which is a uh, API for grabbing data that's built into the browsers and like everything except I and it's got that. So the need to have all this like browser standardization has, has gone away in many ways. So view has lifecycle events um, and one of them is mounted. Um, and mounted is run and the component is put onto the page pretty much. So what I'm doing is I've got this um, GitHub repository of like popular names, and it's got like male names, female names. So when the component's loaded, I grab the um, like masculine names and feminine names, and I stick them into my female names and male names arrays, which are defined up at the top in that like list of all the things we care about. Um, and I've also got a computed property. So views all data based and data driven. And a really cool thing is that you can use computer properties to mash things up. So say you wanted to do like, um, I can't think of a good example, so I'll just use what I've got here. Um, we have those masculine names and feminine names from the GitHub repository, but I couldn't find a source for the two things together. So I'm doing that myself. I've got this um, suggested names method. And that uses Lodash to concatenate the male names and female names, which gives us one fit. And now we've got that as an array. If we jump back to our markup, um, we can use D4, and um, which just loops through things. And this is in a data list, um, which basically gives you sort of like native ish autocomplete. And um, so the data list has got the idea of suggested names, which is also referenced on our um, input. And that's what gives you this sort of like, nice drop down thing. And um, this is kind of, I'm not sure I explained it very well, but like, this is what I mean about using the best bits of HTML and the best bits of JavaScript. We haven't loaded in like an onto complete plugin or anything like that. And um, we're using a kind of flaw for getting that native thing, but we're using view to populate it with the default. Um, so views kind of, well, Vue is comparable in kilobytes to, to jQuery. It doesn't do quite as much, but I think nowadays there's less requirements to have all those things. Um, and you can see that this thing, um, it updates in real time. We can, we can reset things. Things conditionally appear with animations. We can do whatever we want with events. So let's submit after that. Um, 
and all of that comes from sort of 55 lines of quite well spaced out and almost annotated in some places code. So it's doing quite a lot with not much actual work once you get into the mental model of using those few directives in your marker. And it's also much easier when you have more complicated things, like say you had a big, a big um, header which had like uh, a mobile burger menu, but then you also want the site search option, and when the site search appears, you have to make sure the burger menu disappears and so on. You spend a lot less time trying to be like, okay, what classes would this have? What do I need to look for? Instead, you're just querying with the Boolean, it's true, of course. And so I find it's like a much nicer way of working, and I'd encourage you all to try it. That's me. So this is a really rough and ready presentation. Um, the, the idea is that it will become a real presentation at some point. Who's seen my presentation, What's My Name? Right. Um, good. Has anyone seen the What's My Address? John? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, uh, the, why am I asking this? Because this presentation is what's my password. And it was started off uh, when a client, just while I'm loading up, uh, a client asked me, why should they care what they use as password, what the rules were for their use as passwords? Like, if they get hacked, if the user account gets hacked, why should I care? It was their fault. I told them to use a strong password. Um, and it got, me, it got me thinking, and there's actually some really good reasons. Um, the main one is it's not about them getting access to what that user can do. It's about getting privileged access to your site. Now, most of the, um, some of the most common security issues that happen on Drupal and Joomla and WordPress are privilege escalations. So you have to be able to be logged in as something that then you can exploit the vulnerability and you can raise yourself, but you've got to be logged in to start off with. Um, so it's not just about whether their account will get hacked. You don't, you don't necessarily care, but you do care about your site getting hacked. So you need to protect it. So this is a site of the Valley Bank, of the What's My Name talk, which was a, and it was a good example. This was, a, I forgot which site it was, but great, this guy's name was classed as invalid. It's his name. But it was invalid because it uh, only didn't like that O, that Danish O character. Um, so, you know, that says enough. You know, that you know how to spell your own name. So it's the same with passwords. Now I know that we should be encouraging everybody to be using password managers. Now, because password managers are brilliant, you don't need to know what password, it does it all for you, all the rest for you. Not everybody does. That's a fact. It doesn't matter how many times we change, you know, when we shout about it, people are still going to use regular passwords. In fact, a couple of months ago, WordCamp Athens, the gift from one of the sponsors was a very nice notebook to store your passwords. No, 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 definitely serious. In fact, Waterstones sell them as well. Yeah, if you get to Waterstones, go to the Moleskin books. Moleskin have, have one in the series. So people do have crazy things with passwords. At least if they have a book, that means that they are using complicated passwords and they probably are using unique passwords for each one. So it's a start. Yeah? 
Um, so does everyone know this site? Have I been called? Uh, if you don't know, uh, it's run by a guy called Troy? Troy Hunt. Troy Hunt. Uh, also to be an Australian guy um, and works for Microsoft. And he basically has collected every single database that's got exploited ever. And he's put all into a website. And oops, you can go to that website, you can put your email address see if your email address appears in this database. I don't know very well. Right? <laughs> so I put in my email address and it's been odd. Uh, Adobe, Animoto, some combo list, something called Apollo 9 and share this and trick. And this one I thought was quite good, verifications.io is a verification service for email addresses. Um, <laughs> And LinkedIn and LinkedIn, whatever that is, I'm off the two other spam lists. And Bitly and Canva and Discus and Dropbox and Exploited. And that's it. So my that's obviously my username. No, sorry, my email address is on all those databases. But as you can see, some of the, it gives you a clue uh, about what other information is in that data breach. So uh, Discus email address passwords and usernames. Uh, so I know that my email address is there, then presumably my username and the password that I used is also there, but it doesn't give you a clue here if the password was hashed or not, and if it was, or if it's been unhashed. It just as you say that, the Dropbox yeah. one is, is I say it's sort of hashed as a password. Right. That's what it is. Doesn't say on some of the So I started looking and I was thinking, is this a good password? It's got uppercase and lowercase and punctuation marks and exclamation mark at the end. Is that a good password? You'll say no. Anybody disagree? So this is a I think the website this one's on called chooseanewpassword.com or something like that. Um, and he's trying to encourage people to on on the web on their websites where they put a password to have this form and you want at least eight characters, contains uppercase, contains lowercase, contains numbers, contains punctuation. And as you type in your password, they start off everything over it. Great. Why? Well, we know from looking at those databases of passwords that have been exploited that people tend to have a familiar password that they use everywhere. So let's just take uh, NWDuck as my password. And I type it in, and then it says, oh, that's fine, but you need to have a special character. Exclamation mark. You need to have a number. <laughs> NW dog one exclamation mark, pretty good chance that that would be, yeah, you know, would be there. So those are useful to suggest things to people, but making them green and red is encouraging them to actually do it a specific way, to a limited way, and to a known way to someone trying to break into this site. Yeah? So it's good to suggest how to have a secure password, but not to do it this way because it gamifies it and people will uh, do it all where you actually do it with there's validation and it comes back and says, sorry, that password's no good, it needs to have a, an uppercase letter, it needs to have a punctuation. As soon as you do that, they don't change their password, they keep the same password and just add to the end. There's a tool called Hashcat. Has anybody heard of it, played with it? And Hashcat is the biggest password cracking software that exists, and it has special modes for Drupal passwords and Joomla passwords and WordPress passwords, and it has configuration options that just say you use eight letters plus a number at the end. They'll do a dictionary attack of eight letters plus numbers at the end, and things like that. And the way that it works is using, uh, well, we used to use really good graphics cards, we use the graphics processing unit on that, but now you can just 
to get an Amazon machine and to shove it up on there. And it can do probably, I think it's about the latest record, something like a billion, a billion passwords cracked in an hour or something. Yeah, it's obscene. Yeah, absolutely obscene. Check that, I might be get that as another flaw, but it is ridiculous. So as soon as you have something known, like you force them to put a number at the end, or a punctuation mark at the end, you've reduced the complexity, not increased it. So this is uh, Drupal.org, which I'm guessing is Drupal 7. Yes. Right? Because um, you can see it makes a suggestion to make your password stronger. Um, and what it actually does is, as you're typing in, as you fulfill any of those, they do disappear. Yeah, each one disappears. Uh, yeah. <coughs> this was an advert for the notebook. Yeah. <laughs> so it's actually, that's the reason why I this is two separate screenshots because as soon as I typed in the password to get one that said strong, it, all of those shifted up. So not the best thing to do because it's encouraged, it's not forced me to put that exclamation mark at the end, but it has encouraged me to keep working on my password. By the way, this one with a password strength of strong, the highest Drupal.org can give was capital P A 55W0RD exclamation mark. So if you're going to use these password strength things, think about it. Now, I'll come back to that later. This is Drupal 8. Drupal 8's changed it. It now recommends 12 characters. And strength meter, in order for me to get a strong again, I just pasted it in twice. <laughs> yeah? Um, but it's good to have those, but the idea of taking them off or collapsing them, making them disappear, is wrong. Talking of wrong, uh, I spotted this um, when I tried to reset the password for John Doe at example.com. Drupal came back and said, that's not a recognized username or email address. There isn't much of that. Right? There might be much for it. This is at this screenshot, it's not my screenshot. This screenshot is from the Drupal security issue about this. It was opened seven years ago. Yeah, username, username enumeration or email address enumeration is one of the biggest security holes yeah, that a WASP list. That you, can, you should not be able to go and type in any email address and tell you whether that user has an account or not. Yeah, massive, massive no no. I can't believe it's been there for seven years. What I should have said was uh, something more positive, something like, you know, uh, an email has been sent to the register to the registered address. Yeah, or something, you know, something positive or neutral. Yeah, a lot, yeah. A lot of pen testers are fed into that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Out of, and and that, that's why I'm really surprised that out of the box, you know, it's doing that because that's a massive memo. But that's not what I was talking about, so I just said the side. Now, if you're going to use those strength meters, then you work on an algorithm. Yeah. Now I do. I didn't look into Drupal to see how Drupal's what Drupal's algorithm is, but Joomla four currently has an algorithm for a password strength thing, which we haven't actually released yet, yeah. and we probably won't release it in its current form because it does exactly the same as Drupal's. It just counts how many numbers, how many letters, um, how many uppercase, how many lowercase. It says whether it's strong or not. If you really want to test its strength. You need to be looking at what's called the entropy of the password. Yeah? You'll let you Google it later. Entropy of passwords tells you all about it. It's loads of mathematical stuff and formulas and all the rest of it, but it determines what really makes a strong password. Dropbox have a library, ZXCVBA. Yeah, it's reckoned to be uh, the best entropy library yeah, for testing. Sorry, the best library for testing entropies. And it's available on for pretty much every language out there. I, don't, I didn't check to see if there was a Drupal integration, sorry. Where's the difference? This 
It's measuring the entropy in the length. What you really want is massive entropy. Okay? That means it's going to be really complicated to solve. So something like that hash cap is really going to fail. It will take a long, long time to get there. Higher the entropy, more secure it. So this was the password of password, PA55W0RD, exclamation mark. So something with an entropy of 13 was something that Drupal, Drupal 7 said was good. Yeah? When this is showing you, actually, it sucks. Yeah, Because this is testing it with uh, using uh, Dropbox's measures. Now this one, uh, that didn't, I see on the screenshot. Yeah, so on the screenshot here, it says, can you raise the double number, this one to above 55, or maybe even above 70? So I was reading another blog post, and followed their suggestion, and created a password, and I got 71. Which implication, please let it, let it hell, that must be good. And, and what was that password? It was my name and my old childhood telephone number. <laughs> Something really, really easy to remember, but from an entry point of view, in other words, for a, a machine to guess it will be very, very difficult. Yeah? Now, it might not be difficult if someone was targeting me yeah, and specifically trying to break my password. Yeah, because presumably something like that, they might think, well, oh, it's they might be social engineer favorite pins. What's your what's your what are your cats called? Uh, my cat's called two pack. Right, so you could have got two pack London, you know, something or other. Someone might guess those things. They might. I'm not saying they will or they will. Oh, no, no. Uh, no, I was thinking you know, working in London. Uh, okay. Okay. Just uh, it was random words that came to my head. So. But that's the point. And this is Kind of what the horse battery stapler cartoon was about. Although the horse battery horse battery battery stapler, three random words, is actually not a good password because they're three dictionary words. Yeah, and in fact, Hashcat has a mode test for three dictionary words. It runs through the dictionary, puts three words together, and sorts it sorts it out. But this is slightly different. So that's it. All I'm really trying to show here is strength meters are okay if they really are showing something as being strong. Suggestions on the screen about what type of passwords, what should be in your passwords, are good as long as they don't also force you to do something or encourage you to do something because you've immediately made it a bad password. So what can we do? To resolve this all. I've said up there Drupal and I'm going to make the same comment to Jumma. Uh, look at putting this, if you're going to have these strength meters, make sure that they're real strength, not giving users a false impression. Uh, possibly look at including that ZX CPN thing instead of whatever you've got right now. Uh, look at changing the, that, whether those suggestions disappear as you type that's encouraging you to do bad practice. Something else you can do, uh, Troy has created another service, which is not for your email addresses, it's for your passwords. And it's got an API, and what you can do is, you can install it. Um, I did the Joomla version, just got the Joomla, but there's a Drupal one as well. And I typed in a password, again, PA55W0RD, exclamation mark. And when I hit submit on the registration, it goes off to have I been pulled, comes back with a yes or no. It's a bit more complicated than that and more secure, but I'm just simplifying it. And it's come back and said, this password is very weak since it's included inside attackers' dictionaries. Yeah? And in this case, to put this plugin, this module, is not going to let me register with that password. Um, and that's the general one that I just did, but there is a, that's the identical version from the same guy for Drupal. 
Um, but I think there's about four or five other highly important modules for Drupal as well. So they will really good. It stops someone using a specific password that is known. It's a bit better. Yeah. Uh, so the, those are two things I would suggest that are relatively easy wins. Obviously, the real wins to stop people using insecure passwords completely. To actually stop using passwords, put in two-factor or two-factor authentication or two-step verification or multi-step verification, whichever you, know, you want. Or even better, start looking at web auth n. So web auth n is a kind of a two-step authentication method, but built natively into browsers and devices. It's part of the standard, it's part of the W3C standard. It's not rolled out yet to everything, but because it is, I think it only went live a couple of months ago uh, in Chrome. Uh, but it is supported by everyone. You can get hardware keys, software keys, virtual keys, all sorts of stuff. Very, very good. Gets rid of the problem. There's no password being stored. Yeah, much more secure. So those are the things you can do. There is one suggestion that I bought marked ages ago, um, and it's a library. And you can see what happens if you apply the library. So your password must contain one uppercase, one lowercase, and a number. So that's no good. So now, oh, it must be eight characters long. Uh, try again. It can't be the same <laughs> number as <the> password. <laughs> <laughs> This is a real library, it's called the Evil Pass. And what it actually does, purely for research purposes, <coughs> is to attempt to log in to Twitter and Facebook using the details you just typed in. Um, so it's purely for research purposes, I mean, definitely doesn't recommend it, uh, as I said, but it's an interesting idea. Uh, not sure I would implement it myself, and that's why I'm showing you in that way. It is uh, from his own side. Um, but interesting idea you know, to think about stop actually physically stopping someone from using a password you used before. Is it a Welsh person that wrote that? Uh, I have no idea. I think, I've got a feeling that might have been his uh, GitHub account name. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, but at the end of the day, what I want to say is passwords do matter. They have to be <coughs> secure, but do it the right way. But uh, you might think, what I'm saying is you might think you're doing it the right way, but you explain to me to put those rules on and checking it off. You're not making it stronger, you're making it weaker. And that's all I want to say about it. And obviously, the other one is don't copy paste. Don't stop people pasting in their password, copy and paste in their passwords. And because you need to kind of the password manager. And still have that today, I think it's sometime there. Yeah, so it's not rare, occurrence. it's still big organizations still think it's the right thing to do for security purposes. Yeah. Um, but sometimes there's because it asks for certain things out of your. No, it was before that, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. So I need to reset the password. And the reset password box doesn't like you paste in. So I have to type in something that you remember. It's going to be exasperated. It's very easy to pick in. Do we have an extra I've sent a link. How did you send it to me? So, okay. Seven years ago, which it went to just as a bug, a normal level. And there hasn't actually been a real fix. None of the, none of the pack, all the patches that people have been for, so something, yeah, need to work or something. 
Okay, so um, genetic algorithms. Uh, so this uses the process of natural selection, uh, which is a quite local term, to find out the sort of optimal, optimal solution for problems. So that uses um, lots of biological well things by mechanisms to do analysis of problems. Um, in this facet of artificial intelligence, you can see some, you can see some examples of that. Um, why would you use this? So uh, you can do computer-aided design, so you can throw lots of problems at a solution and pick the sort of right ones that look like the right thing and go from there. Um, you know, what's persistent, what's optimization, so if you're looking for the, the best class or something, you can try out different groups and then sort of keep trying them until it gets, gets the right example. Uh, mutation testing is a weird one. It's, um, it's a way of taking a test or your code and mutating the syntax a little bit to see if it breaks. <laughs> but yeah, we'll go into that too much. <clears throat> um, so some lessons from biology. Uh, this one gets interesting. So natural selection is uh, it describes the process. So it's it's a process where individuals who are retroactive to their environment are selected to reproduce and pass on traits to the next generation. So the evolution bit. Uh, it just describes the change over time, which isn't necessarily describe the process. The process is natural selection. Um, but it isn't it isn't random, it is it is guided random. So there's no there's no sort of end game to it, if that makes sense. There's no thing like this is what we're gonna get to. It's more like this is what the best solution looks like. Let's go forward with, with that. Um, so uh, DNA, everyone know DNA is? Just, just <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about, about how cells work a little bit. So DNA transmits to RNA, which then converts to uh, proteins of some kind. So basically this is the, the data storage mechanism, and this is what happens on the other side to produce like the skin color and well, literally everything about it. Um, so mutation happens when the DNA is changed. And if you change the DNA, you change the resulting protein a little bit, which might have a good effect, it might have a bad effect, but that essentially is, you know, that's what controls uh, evolution, or not just selection. Um, you can also get the single crossover, so, you know, two individuals get together and they mate, <laughs> you, they can uh, combine their DNA together and you get Half of the mother, half of the father. That looks like the same individual. <laughs> <laughs> you can at least, you can at least mirror the image. <laughs> I think you need a different title on that slide. I didn't want to, yeah, I didn't want to put any, any labels on. Uh, so, <laughs> so, two terms that might come interesting uh, put later on so genotype and phenotype. Uh, so, genotype is, is the DNA, so it's the genes. Um, and phenotype is, is the outward experience, the outward appearance of the individual. Um, so take this example. So you get your DNA and you go through this um, synthesis uh, pathway to come up with this protein called, well, this compound called immunoglobulin. Um, so that's interesting, but uh, that's a genotype. But really, what that translates to is that the right is brown or black. Um, so high levels of this protein in the rat causes the presentation. So that's genotype and the phenotype. So on to the algorithms. Um, so you start off with a population of individuals, and this might be solutions to a problem. You then test the fitness of each of the individuals, and then uh, you 
you delete ones that are less suited to that, to that problem. And then you sort of mutate them across them over to see um, which individuals then become better suited in looking at this fitness ratio. So what you're doing is, is you're in this big circle. So uh, you get your individuals, you mutate them slightly into, into it's just a couple of individuals with difference there. Uh, they divide with their fitness, so you might uh, you might give them a score of 10, or you might decide on whatever. Um, you then remove the unfit individuals and replicate them to create the full population again, and then you just pass that against the problem. Um, so let's look at some examples. So, uh, string evolution. So, this is um, where I took some random strings, and it's good example of distance, which is uh, you feel it's essentially a function of PHP, and it'll give you a value of fitness. Um, this is guided evolution, so we sort of know where we want to get to, and we're trying to get, trying to mutate the string into that, into that thing. So, 10 random strings. Um, uh, um, where we've mutated or rid of the things that don't fit along the quite well, um, replicate the other ones and then mutate them some more. It's all nonsense, but yeah, we're getting there. After 100 generations, uh, we start to see some structure again, but there's still uh, nothing going on. I know this is the phrases, by the way. Let's see if you can guess it <laughs> before, before the end. Uh, after 500 generations, we're starting to see like, there's definitely uh, two words going on, three words. Um, this wasn't making any sense. Uh, after 500, for a thousand generations, sorry, <laughs> it was what you say, what you do. Uh, and we're nearly there, like, this, we can't get the second one, but I'm sure if we kept on iterating this, uh, these populations, we'd probably get there at the end. So, um, yeah. Another example is color evolution. Uh, this is a simple example of where uh, the genotype. Is, is the hex value, but the field type will be the color that we're seeing here. Um, so we store this as a, as a property in class, and we just check that um, color. So it also gives us uh, easy way mutations, so we can just change the character, and that becomes a different color, that's easy enough. Uh, or we can cross them over by, by swapping them over, like the red component, or the blue component, um, and creating different colors like that. So, uh, so what we do is we start off with um, 10 individuals of uh, all white. And what we're doing is we have the fitness factor of lightness. So lightness is, is kind of like perceived color values. It's, it's like um, uh, so white doesn't have much of a light. Uh, but, but these four colors of water do. So after 200 generations, and all we've given it is, is this value, but it doesn't, it doesn't know about anything else. Um, after 200 generation, generations, we get this one. Color time at the bottom, uh, which is good. Um, yeah, so I built a tool to help me out with this uh, called Revolution. I think that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the end, end goal with this uh, for me was to, was to create a program that involved web pages and these techniques. So uh, taking the CSS and the JavaScript and trying to mutate them in different ways. To produce uh, this effect. So, uh, the internal structure is like this. So, we've got the type, uh, which is then wrapped by the individual, and then you get a population of individuals, and then your evolution engine basically loops through the smooth populations, figuring out what um, fitness calculations um, So, for example, you might have color, and then color, color individual, which then wraps. Um, it's basically a way of abstracting out the, the sort of. So, color knows about color, obviously, but it doesn't know how to mutate itself. That's the job of individual, because it's, you know, it doesn't, doesn't make sense for the color class to understand that. And the population is literally just a collection of design facts. It's just a, a list of objects in an array. The page evolution uh, has a slightly more complicated type. Uh, so we've got style uh, type uh, and a color type, which feeds into the style type. Uh, and there's other types of things. So if you've got like background color, you can represent that as a, as a type, which means you can mutate that color. Um, 
and the other uh, the actual body tag is represented by uh, the number of the element. And I might have more elements inside it. So um, you can build up fairly complicated structures of uh, objects. I also built a demo application. So this is written in Slim framework, and you can download it and run it. It's got a basically composer install and it's the rest of the light, so it's really simple to, to get going. Um, <coughs> yeah, that's just what it was like demo, but I'm not a machine, but never mind. Uh, if you're interested in more resources, um, Richard Dawkins uh, wrote a book called The Blind, Blind Watchmaker, which actually talks about making a, a new evolution engine on its own, which is kind of what they did. Uh, but he, he looked at specifically uh, selecting for traits of um, basically pictures of uh, pixels. So there's a little pixel style on the important animal. They were selecting for like ones with spiky spikes and things. And spikes. <laughs> um, this is a quite cool example of a genetic cast. So randomly generated track and randomly generated buggies with wheels and and things and there's only got a few a few genes where it's like how big the wheels are and what the shape of the body is and they just run down this track and it mutates the ones that get the furthest and so you can see it's like yeah, they start getting further and further and further through this track just by you know understanding which one is the fittest one all those different things um this uh here is a code train playing with youtube that he's it's very interesting. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> um, he's written a whole, a, a whole series of videos about genetic algorithms and writing it. Um, the system he uses is called uh, Process, so J, a JavaScript yeah. sort of application thing. Um, but it, it, it's designed to produce graphics, which is where the sort of uh, begins. In, so uh, that's quite cool. Uh, this was another YouTube video um, series where he built up things that walk. Basically, using the same system the process uh, and just counted his fitness was how far they walked down the track and he took the best one. So, yeah. Uh, any questions? <laughs> I'll give you a demo if you like. Do you want to do a demo on that part? Oh, if it's just the download and. <coughs> Is that download from that link that you use? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is totally work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I find you can make um, directories with emojis in. <laughs> so let's put this here. <laughs> right, you can see these touches. <laughs> it looks a bit weird. <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, no, that's a, also tell them apart the because it doesn't show up here. But, oh, no, it actually does show up. That's why I can probably Just see it. See Just that bit. You can use the really useful one. Smiley <laughs> cat. Gosh. <laughs> it even shows it. It doesn't work for some, so lightning doesn't work, but smiley cat. Certainly. I've just realised I've got the directory called the unfuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great idea. It was like that. It's actually right. a fairly common silence. <laughs> 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 Maybe if you're a company, you don't know. Just, yeah. Do you propose me to? <laughs> so this is when he uh, composer installs evil pass. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the pimple from slightly. Yeah. 
Hey, not for a while. It's like oh, a service of the temple, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I believe uh, step four is a bit different. I thought step was always going to work. Well, that's the whole point of this. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> it's still acrobat. I'm going to say no. Oh, I think he's still done. Okay. He said he was doing something else. <laughs> exactly. In January, he said he was doing something else. But I don't know what it was. Hey, we can look at cars while this is doing it. Just you can't see it. There we go. <laughs> so these are your cars that are done by the next camera and practical you can see. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty very far early. There you go. So the yeah, so you can say like the four is fixed, so um, it's always the same path. Um, so you scroll down to see what kind of genes they have, so such as uh, shape, wheel size, wheel position, wheel density, and chassis densities. Yeah. More car showroom should tell you about the wheel density. Yeah. See, but they see the, the, the best individual for the last one is now. The, the, top, the top three individuals in this one. So. Wow. This is a little bit of mutation. This is the most exciting science I've ever seen. Oh, fail. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and it's the roundness. You see, he got just a little bit further than the last time. So it's, it's incrementing. Um, not all the evolution is great, though. That's obviously not going to happen. So I'm just doing something with a nudge. Do you love the way it will like drop some more? Like, <laughs> yeah. oh, you carry me in the beginning. Oh, so the different wheel colours are probably their density then? I think so. It does say what the other one is in the skull there. Ah. Oh, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Go on! Oh, I'm pretty tough to actually have to see how that converts into the Oh, it's that. Okay, so we leave the cars when I get the back. <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah. Can we split screen? <laughs> <laughs> no, because there's none of you who watch a film that much. The film's never going to be better. The film works on this. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I have no idea what's going on. Can you run this through? Maybe it just doesn't like being in this director with a cat in it. Could be. <laughs> yeah. No such table. Do you need to give it any kind of. Oh, is that what's going on? Is there that's just, yeah. that's just sort of sad. Yeah, there we go. We flush it a bit. So this is um, a bunch of individuals that are pages. So each each of these is an I frame containing uh, an LI tag and an E tag, or a double tag or something. Um, so you can look at the inspect of that. Uh, you see it's got HTML in the head. There is some background in there. Basically, uh, styling generated from the, from the Eastern one. So, as a first run, it doesn't actually do anything. The idea is you pick the individuals that you want, and then you can see it's got slightly bolded now, so that's great. Uh, pick that one. And then that carries on to the next generation. Uh, we've got some color going on here, so we can. More color, more tanks being generated. More tanks. Uh, I have to say, I've not actually produced anything decent. <laughs> 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 um, after hundreds of generations, it just looks crap. So, um, yeah. It's a good one. So, how, how is that being assessed for fitness? Well, I'm literally just picking the best of the Oh, okay. Oh, it's just like. You're encoding, so this is all your fault. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so because because you know I'm not Google, so I can't tell one if how one page uh, compares to another. Uh, 
So and I think I think developing that kind of fitness game is is really good. Really. So um, I decided that the directed evolution was probably better in picking the best individuals and going from there. Um, but I have I have like run this for hundred generations. I'm kind of so just like I'm going to. But you didn't just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> so so when you did that, how did it choose for fitness if you were automating it? Uh, basically the length of the road page. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine why that didn't come out with some of Yeah. Um, Can you know, just like pipe it into hot or not or something? And <laughs> members of the public to just click on which version they find more attractive. <laughs> yeah, you, you could be, you could do that crowd sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but this this is a rough road up so far, so Obviously, <laughs> you mean it's not in production? <laughs> I think you're being very cruel. I think it's really clever. It's just that the fitness bit isn't quite. Yeah, I mean, it's, what what would be nice is to, is to select more than one individual at a point and yeah, one of those group. Yeah. Or you just have it like submitted like to the design department, and then they just like <laughs> just sit there clicking on stuff. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so the next next stage is to click is to create a little button that says download and it gives you HTML that generates. Yeah. Um, you could write like Shakespeare this way. I'm sure you could, but you'd have to probably give it Shakespeare to mutate it. <laughs> Um, yeah. 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 There was also um, so just showing this connection. So there's this thing called image evolution. This is a a multi multi dimensional array which represents just an image. So um, basically, the uh, a one in the multi dimensional array becomes a pixel. Okay, and when we mutate, we just add a pixel anywhere next to uh, the the current assigned pixel. And all it knows about it is how high it is. So the fitness is basically how high up the, the box um, it can grow. Uh, and so very quickly we reach a situation where uh, things are starting to grow off, off the floor. And this is only after 50 generations. Um, we created a lot of pictures of this is going, <laughs> it's not going well. Um, but it's not, it's not randomly created things, it's, it's all about how high it is and the best individuals. So, those individuals that are getting lines to um, so run that again, we get different results. And if you're, if you're feeling brave, you can work this up to a thousand and see how far up the uh, generation state is. Yeah. I thought that was a nice uh, example of um, this in action as well. It's called Silver. <laughs> it's like a guy falling on his face. But <laughs> <laughs> that is. About on par with the entire 2600 <laughs> yeah. In fact, I think at one point in my life I would have been scared of something like that. <laughs> okay, I think that's good. So you can add this, this will play with it. Cool. Is the task okay? <laughs> Just on the car, of course, but I don't know if you saw the uh, Sky at Night special for the moon landing. Yeah, and it was showing you the current sort of experimental uh, Mars vehicles uh, for, for exploring that the, the, uh, the spacesuit is actually built into the Explorer. Yeah. So, uh, but, and the, the, the crab like design. So it can go sideways as well as, but you can just imagine the design that's like using tools <laughs> like this, you know. Um, is it wheels? Is it tracks? How far it was? It wasn't, I uh, saw it, wasn't it? The, they were ridiculously close together, the wheels. That didn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. With no, over, with no overhang. 
So you just press the surprise button, Bill. Yeah, then that turns off the rendering. So oh, okay. okay, so it advances it quicker. Yeah. Oh, this one's so. That's where I got to before. That's a really cool. Nope. Yeah, I'm not sure they're going to get over that. <laughs> There's another YouTube called Cold Bullet, which does quite a lot of this sort of stuff. Okay. And, uh, Oh, oh, did he do the one where it was like automated snake and stuff? But yes. then by, um, yes. Yeah, by genetic algorithms and stuff. But yeah, he's good. Yes. Quite even as to this. Oh, this is the guy who does. Oh, it's like a game. Yeah. Like that. It's still going there, is it? Right. That's enough of that for us. Panel 5 will actually turn this into a TV program. <laughs> yeah. right? Put this on in the background at 3 o'clock in the morning. People who are this one's got chewing. This one's got chewing. Oh, right. Uh, right. <laughs> I'm gonna close that. I'm gonna close that. Oh. 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 Show you something. Well, it's nice to start a talk from that from being food. <laughs> like things in theory can only get up from here unless there's physical violence, <laughs> like throwing stuff. But like the Hong Kong protest of yeah. laser. So, um, right, I was going to quickly talk, I don't have slides, um, but I was going to talk about uh, JSON API, um, which I've been using a lot of recently. Let's kill the application <laughs> cap. Uh, let's kill that. Well, I don't want that. Let's keep it. Cool. Um, so, uh, all I was going to do was show how easy it is to figure out, figure out how easily it is, easy it is, and how easily you then figure out what to stop in JSON API when you're using it to uh, push data into the book. So, JSON API is, this is just a core latest 8.8.x uh, Drupal JSON API went in straight and table in 7, so you can just use it without worrying about it going away. And all you need to do is uh, turn it on in your module list. So, JSON API now shows up in core, it's stable, and you need to turn serialization on as well, uh, which might be turned on if you just install using standard or even um, the lowest level of file install. So, all you need to do is to turn it on. And if you actually want to write data using JSON API, it has a setting to say whether you've got it configured to only expose data for read or whether you're actually going to permit your system to accept, uh, create, update, and delete operations for actually changing data. So that's a sidewipe uh, configuration uh, that you need to set. It will default to read only. And the other thing that you need to do is have the uh, permission set up so that when you're using a user to post it into JSON API, that you have permissions to create a content type. So there's no different permissions for allowing people to use JSON API to create an article. If you have a user who can log in and create an article and they're accessing the site over JSON API, then they will be able to uh, write content. So there's no separate uh, permission system. If you set anonymous users to be able to create content, you wouldn't even have to have any kind of authentication. Obviously, back in uh, Contra, uh, there's a user I've created called Jason, who uh, has just got the admin role, so he's got all the permissions, so that's why we can use it. If we are using an authenticated user to create stuff over JSON API, then we need some way of identifying that user to Drupal. Uh, so in core, we have a basic auth module. So I've turned that on as well. And that lets us use um, HTT basic authentication uh, in our request so we can actually start creating content. And JSON API looks pretty much the same on the way in as it does on the way out. So if I go to slash JSON API, this is one of the, like, there's very few things you have to remember to get started and to get the information to um, get in here to what the stuff looks like. So once we've got those, once we've got the JSON API and the serialization modules turned on, 
if we're using a hybrid privilege, we can just go to slash JSON API, and that will show us all of the things in the site that we can start to play with on JSON API. So we have uh, uh, links. I mean, uh, so this is links all the things. These are there's very specific terminology in JSON API. So these are resource objects that we're going to link out to. Uh, anything you can link to in JSON API is a resource. Uh, so these will go to collections of resources. So if you wanted to have a look at the uh, articles, we have node hyphen hyphen article, which will be exposed here. I think you can use the JSON API extras module to change the paths, but these identifiers should be consistent. So this is the bundle. And this is the concept type. Sorry, this is the concept type, which is the bundle. This is the entity type. Uh, and you'll see that a lot. For non bundleable entity types, they'll actually be the same identifier twice. So, for instance, actions aren't bundleable. So it's like action, action. Uh, so, articles, JSON API, click through to here, slash node, slash article. Um, this element at the top is just information about the request itself. Uh, and then we actually have the data. So this has come back to JSON. Uh, this is an array with all our articles in, and we have two. So we get some information about the type. Um, this is a link to just the article. So this path is just the article. Um, and then we have the attributes. So Drupal internally is just what we call in. Uh, and bid, and which goes all the stuff should look fairly uh, familiar. We don't have a path I hit on this yet because we don't have path also set up and we have time to set on. Uh, and we can see body field, uh, which is a compound field, so we've got the value and the format and stuff like that. Uh, we have some comment information and then we have some relationships uh, to other things in the system. So we have a relationship saying what our node type is. These IDs are just the UIDs. So we'll be primarily using them when communicating. Uh, so yeah, if we want to um, push this in, it is going to look, the JSON we have to send to create our school looks like this, is going to be in a similar kind of shape. Uh, images are interesting because um, they have files uh, and then a reference to that, and then all the information is actually there. So if we want to create something, I'm going to use Postman and I this is in nicely. I really will be looking at that. So, in order to um, create uh, a resource object in a collection, you want to post to the URL that that object is a part of. So, when we were listing all the articles, afterwards, this JSON API slash node slash article at the top. So if you want to create something in this collection, that's where we're going to post to. Uh, so or we, let's have a look at what something in this collection looks like. So let's go to the link just for this. So we just get here. OK, it looks like that. I'm just going to copy and paste this one. So this is just going to post to this site you know, article. Um, we're going to put some JSON in here. There's some headers we need to set, um, and it's the content type and the accept. So the application slash BND plus JSON. Um, all I've done at the moment is copy and paste that um, body, the data from there. That's not going to work if we send it, but we should have to get an error back. Yeah. Okay, so all of those copy and paste it, try and just put the same thing back in, and we've got meaningful error out 403. The current user is not allowed to post the selected field and Drupal internal in it. So I just copied that out. We know that when you create a new article, it's going to get a new niche, so we can't actually specify that. So let's start trimming this down to the very basic um, that we need. So type, node article, we need that. Uh, we're not going to generate this ID, and we don't need to set the links, so let's get rid of it. So we have to be really careful about cranking brackets. So that's 
Um, and then attributes, again, this is the specific thing it's complained about, so we'll get rid of that. We'll tell it it's English. We don't have to give it a revision log. State is true, that means it's going to be published, or it can change. We don't want to set. Uh, let's give it a different type of article, so article to get it by. Uh, we're not going to split, I think. We're not going to surpass, we'll keep it simple. Body is, is my body. We don't need to set the process to the format, let's give it the right. Uh, let's get rid of the comments that we have And relationships will keep. Sorry, get rid of that because we've got the notes item in the uh, data attributes. And revision information we care about, we care about links. Uh, we don't care about the UID because it knows who we are. Oh, and I haven't changed how we've done that. Totally not counting any brackets in. So we're going to have to indent this, indent this to make sure it makes sense. Can you, can you click this, this button here? Oh, is there a magic button? Jason. Jason. Oh, Jason. No, nope. yeah. there. Oh. Ah, we get this. <coughs> oh, I'm on this page. I can't find that as well. Here's the app. Ah. Top row. Nice one. If it's bad, it's not there. It's bad, Jason. <laughs> ah, okay. Closing brackets at the end of the What? Oh, yes, yes, it is. It is. Yeah. The whole point of this talk is not to show how good I am at doing this, it's to show how easy it is. And all the things I'm doing right now are not difficult. Oh, it's showing as an error. Oh, that's cool. Uh, that's probably fine. Oh, no, it's the last step. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's that one. Okay, it's that one. Now let's get this because that's just like not enough of these. <laughs> oh, man. Yes! yes. Unspot media type. Ah, uh, okay, so when I change this to text, that's actually, um, it changed my content type there. So, or when I put Jason there, so it's just a postman thing. If I set that back, it would give us. Yes. Oh, that's right. Cool, so we've got response code to one creator. Click it. Uh, if we have a look in Drupal. Last call we did live, I'm just doing the same, right? Um, and we can say we change this, uh, and it's submitted by Jason. How did it know who we are? Well, you have an option in um, in, in uh, Postman to say the username and password. So these are my Drupal credentials, uh, and then Postman will actually put those correctly into so like concatenates them together with a colon in the middle and then hashes it. Uh, so using this, you can get really far in creating things from remote systems in your Drupal system uh, just by using JSON API and not really having to look up anything. I didn't Google anything to figure out how to put that in. I just said to Drupal, what does this look like? And OK, I cut a load of stuff out. Um, I just trimmed it back to what I actually wanted to put in and stuff that I knew Drupal would generate. Um, but yeah, JSON API is great to be really productive with and start pinging data around. This doesn't have to be from Postman, this could be from another Drupal system, so we're using it at the moment to syndicate content between sites. Uh, we're doing a lot more sophisticated things than this, but this is how we got started and then we built just doing, uh, simple things like this. This can be done from your client end, so if you're running decoupled, people are creating content in your nice uh, 
front end that hasn't been anywhere near Drupal, but they can post it back to Drupal just by uh, using uh, mechanisms like this. Uh, one of the drawbacks is um, if you are posting things like images, you need to post an image separately, then you need to probably post a request to create a media entity that is going to refer to that image, then you're going to need to um, create the node that's going to refer to that media image, and all multiple HTTP requests. There is a brilliant module called sub-requests, which actually, if you install that on your Drupal site, lets you send a bunch of sub-requests wrapped up in JSON as a single HTTP request, and Drupal just works through them. And the really cool thing about that is it uses uh, placeholders like tokens in your sub-request that you're defining. So you can say, issue this sub-request to create the paragraph, for instance, because paragraphs need to be created individually. You can't create a page with a paragraph built in as a separate HTTP request. But you can say, when you created that, this placeholder is going to refer to the ID that I get back out of that request. So the second request, even though it doesn't know what that embedded ID is going to be, the great paragraph we want to put in, it will just pattern match it and replace it as it goes through. Uh, so it's really, really powerful stuff. You can't do the embedding of files, that needs to be a separate request as far as I can tell. But yeah, uh, Jason API, go and have a play with it. It tells you how to do it. It's Especially if you use Postman. If you use Postman, but using Postman makes it so much easier to get the around. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I've got to the point now where I'm not using Postman yeah. to test stuff out. I'm just writing stuff using Guzzle and building modules. Yeah, let's have a, just to get your head around actually going. what it's doing. And yeah, that's uh, great. Yeah, and also, yeah, so in, in the response that we get back, we actually get things like the ID. So we can drop this when we get it back if we need to store it uh, in our call. So anyway, quick talk, but that's uh, how to get started punching stuff in with Jason. Cool. I think we have run out of time, Phil. You will not get to do the second talk if that's all right. Uh, it, was, no, it was just showing some new stuff from real projects. So it's not a big deal. It was just an exercise of that. Wicked. Right, let's go to the phone.